Good afternoon. Thank you for attending the Basics of Poultry Health and Management webinar presented by Dr. Mohamed El Ghazar, Extension Veterinarian and Assistant Professor with The Ohio State University. My name is Eric Kolofsky. I am the Sustainable Agriculture Educator with the Ohio Ecological Food and Farm Association, and I will moderate this afternoon's presentation. This event is part of a series of educational programs offered by OFA and the OSU Veterinarian Extension to practice in veterinarians, farmers, and animal health professionals who work with certified livestock. OFA was founded in 1979 and is a grassroots coalition of farmers, backyard gardeners, consumers, retailers, educators, researchers, and others. For more than 35 years, OFA has used education, advocacy, and grassroots organizing to promote local and organic food systems. We are also one of the country's largest and oldest accredited organic certification agencies, certifying a diversity of operations throughout the Midwest. For more information about OFA, you can find us on the web at www.oeffa.org. With an office in every county and celebrating its 100th anniversary this year, the Ohio State University Extension is the official outreach program of the University's College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences with additional faculty and staff in the College of Education and Human Ecology and the College of Veterinary Medicine. The core of OSU's extension focuses on four areas, enhancing agriculture and the environment, strengthening families and communities, advancing employment and income opportunities, and preparing youth for success. Partial funding for this webinar is provided through a grant from the North Central Region Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. NCR SARE has awarded more than $40 million worth of competitive grants to farmers, ranchers, researchers, educators, public and private institutions, nonprofit groups, and others exploring sustainable agriculture in 12 states. We thank SARE for this support. The questions this evening will be moderated. If you have a question, please type it into the box on your screen. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. Please feel free to submit questions or points of clarification as they come to mind. Dr. El Ghazar will monitor questions and may address them during the presentation, but otherwise, questions will be held until the designated question period at the end. We are pleased and fortunate to introduce Dr. Mohamed El Ghazar as our presenter. Dr. El Ghazar has direct experience in clinical production and research aspects of the poultry industry, and we hope that this presentation can enhance the triple bottom line of your sustainable poultry operation. Without further ado, Dr. Mohammed El Ghazar. All right. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry about that. And, um, and thank you, uh, Eric, for the introduction. Um, I just wanted to point out that my email address and my phone number is that as at the bottom of the first slide. Um, after the presentation, please feel free to contact me anytime if you have any questions. And we should be able to share that presentation with you guys in a PDF format. It will act as a good reference for you um, uh, uh, in terms of poultry diseases. So with that, I'll go ahead and start the presentation. So we're all familiar with the new trends in food production. We have organic food, free range, and there are also movements like uh, produce local, eat local. And what that did is it produced a shift in poultry population. There was a, a, a study by USDA released in 2013 where they studied the urban chicken ownership in four big U.S. Um, cities, Denver, Los Angeles, Miami, and New York. And they found that the ownership of uh, chicken um, was around 1% of all households. But they also predicted that this population is going to quadruple within the next four years. It's going to be up to 4%. And one important note that they mentioned also, that there was not enough veterinary services to cover that population. There are not enough uh, veterinarians um, to help with, with poultry diseases um, uh, for that population. However, backyards are not only urban. There are urban, suburban, and rural setups for backyards. Um, in average, the backyard population uh, is about 49 birds, but it really starts from few birds up to hundreds and sometimes thousands. They are still food animals. They're uh, not pets. However, some of us will blur the line between, between the two. Um, and there are two aspects of poultry health. There is the population health, 
which deals with outbreaks, infectious diseases, and individual uh, medicine health with stuff like injuries, broken bones, broken wings, and stuff like that. And in this presentation, we are going to approach the Boulder backyard health from the population medicine point of view. The poultry uh, population uh, in the United States is mainly chicken. Uh, there are some turkeys and there are other species including uh, uh, ducks, pheasants, um, guinea fowls, quails, and other species as well. And also last year in 2013, the Wall Street Journal published an article saying that uh, stating the problem that there are not enough health services, services available for, that, for the backyard po uh, population. And they mentioned that there is a gap uh, that needs to be filled. And I predict that this gap should be filled with small animal, mixed animal practice uh, veterinarians, um, or even there is a, a potential for poultry uh, specialist uh, clinics or uh, poultry specialist practices. So um, with the increase in that population, I think this gap is going to get only wider and the need is going to be um, um, increased. So, um, and the purpose, the purpose of this presentation is to help the audience acquire the basics, the necessary tools to um, address or at least approach poultry disease um, in, these, in, in the backyard population and in other populations as well. And the, the audience, looking at the registration list, the audience for this presentation is extremely diverse, which is a very good thing. We have veterinarians, we have veterinary students, we have extension agents, flock owners, both in, in all setups, urban, suburban, or rural setups. Um, and these flocks are between hobby and semi-commercial or even commercial flocks. Um, I looked at the list and I saw that the uh, flock owners have flocks ranging between three birds and three million birds. So, um, and they represent about 20 states in the United States and Canada. So, given the diversity of that uh, of the audience here today, I am going to uh, try to accommodate everybody's background. But this this presentation is going to be um, disease heavy. It's going to discuss poultry diseases a little bit of depth, but even if you're not a veterinarian, you should be able to get something out of this presentation that will help you approach poultry and poultry health and poultry disease diagnosis. All right, let's go ahead and learn about poultry diseases. So, um, poultry disease diagnosis and control. This is, again, this is the aim of this presentation. I'm trying to equip the audience with frame of mind and tools that they can use to approach diagnosing and controlling poultry diseases. And for that, we are going to use clinical history, clinical signs, and necropsy lesions to generate what we call the rule out list, which is a list of suspected diseases. And we're going to use that rule out list to direct our laboratory diagnosis and our control practices. And for those of you who are not veterinarians, clinical history um, means just the story of the case. You know, when they started to become sick, what, what, what did they show? And clinical signs, again, are simple words. Um, uh, coughing, sneezing, diarrhea, what kind of signs that they are showing? And necropsy lesion, uh, again, um, is just the, the lesion that they show on their bodies. I'm going to start from the end here. I'm going to start with the control. I'm going to discuss what tools do we have to control diseases before going into diagnosing and identifying those diseases. The tools that we have are as follows. We have good management, we have biosecurity, and we have uh, vaccination. And if the, um, if the disease happens, if the infection happens after all these tools have been implemented, we still have to uh, treat the flocks, and, and especially in extreme cases when the birds are um, sick and, and, and in some cases dying. So, um, all the first three tools that we have can be organic. Unfortunately, the last one, if we reach the last stage, most of that is going to be in, inorganic. So, um, you need to be aware of that and, and factor that in your decision. 
all the first three steps steps can be under the prevention. The last one is primarily control. So we are trying to prevent the disease from reaching the population. But if this happens, we are trying to control that disease from affecting the flock, or having minimum effect on the, on the flock. We're also trying to control that disease from spreading and, and infecting other, other birds as well. And given that, you know, in some cases we are going to resort to uh, use some non-organic treatments, um, these are very important sources to keep in mind to understand which um, treatments are organic and which treatments or material that we are using are non-organic. So um, please use these uh, resources and, and factor that in, into your decision. All right, let's start with the first tool that we have, which is good management. I'm not going to talk a lot about good management. Um, it's mostly common sense and we all know about good management. I'm just going to touch and, and, and list all the factors that I think about when I think about good management. And these are all factors that you should keep in mind as well when you think about poultry health and poultry diseases. So feed, importance of good balanced ration and uh, fresh feed, water, clean and, and, and hopefully disinfected or, or uh, even better disinfected. Uh, the habitat of the birds so when I think about the habitat of the birds, I think about the stocking density. Is there enough space for everybody? I think about temperature of the habitat. I think about the ventilation of the habitat and other factors like cleaning and disinfectants, um, uh, bedding material, lighting. All these are factors that we should consider um, in, uh, when we are designing or we are, when we are choosing the habitat for the, for the birds. Again, each of these factors could have a lecture on their own for, for an hour or maybe several hours. And that's why I'm just listing these factors to consider when you have uh, a problem with the, with the health of the birds. Um, another thing that I want to emphasize is separate age and separate species. So it's a very good practice to have the birds um, separated by age and separated by species. I know in many cases that's not possible, but if this, po if this is possible in your setup, whether that's backyard or um, semi-commercial or commercial, please go ahead and do that and practice that uh, uh, age separation and species separation. All right, so that's the good management. The next tool that we have in, at our disposal to control diseases, to prevent diseases from, from reaching our population is biosecurity. And we've heard that word many, many times, but I just, again, I want to touch on the basics of that concept of the biosecurity. So the main goal, the purpose of biosecurity is to prevent pathogens from accessing our population, which is in this case uh, poultry. The goal is not sterility. We are not in, in an operation room. We are not working in an operating room. We are still working in, in farm conditions, in backyard conditions, so sterility is almost impossible. We are just trying to prevent those pathogens, uh, specific pathogens um, that infect our birds from reaching the fox. And in order to achieve that goal, we use general sanitary practice, uh, practices. And when we say specific poultry pathogens, it's just specific poultry pathogens. It's, it's not even all poultry pathogens. Some of the poultry pathogens are very resilient to the environment, and they will exist in your farm or in your backyard, no matter what practices you have. Uh, examples for that, uh, coccidial parasites. These are protozoans that will have very hard eosis, and they will exist in the environment. They are ubiquitous you literally cannot prevent them from reaching your, your flocks. But some other diseases, um, examples like Newcastle or, in, or, or, or uh, uh, influenza or any other viral infections, we can affect those and we can prevent those from reaching the flocks. Um, so it's important to know that biosecurity is not going to affect all the diseases of poultry, just some of them. And it's also important to to understand where these diseases are coming from. So what, what is the source of the pathogens that we're talking about? And the sources, as you might expect, is other poultry farms or other poultry flocks. 
uh, birds, including wild birds, animals, including dogs and cats and wild animals, and probably the most important of all is humans, and, and, and humans can transmit diseases to poultry. So we, we, we know that the purpose of biosecurity is not sterility. We're just trying to prevent some of those diseases to reach the flock. We know the sources of these uh, uh, diseases, where they are coming from. Now it's important to understand what are the routes of the infection. How do they reach from their source to our population? So examples for that, introducing new birds to the flock. That's a, a way that the disease can take to reach your population. People, visiting people, uh, service people, or even owners can transmit diseases. They can carry diseases on their clothes, on their shoes. Um, sometimes it's even biologically transmitted. Uh, uh, some diseases can be transmitted from people to, um, uh, to poultry. Inanimate objects like dust, feather, manure, equipments, all of these can be vehicles that that they are used by poultry pathogens to reach poultry population. Wild birds, predators, rodents, flies, and insects that have access to your flock, all of these can be vehicles for disease. Contaminated feed or water, and some of those diseases can be transport, uh, uh, transmitted by air, so they are airborne diseases. We understand the diseases now. We understand the sources of the diseases. We, we know that there are certain routes that these diseases take. Now, it's the biosecurity is to put intervention and put barriers against those diseases through the routes to prevent them from reaching the population, just send them out uh, uh, all at the same time. For people to prevent diseases, um, some facilities are showering, shower out. Um, so you shower in, you change your clothes, and change um, your shoes, and go into the flock, trying to prevent um, uh, uh, contacting uh, or bringing disease into the into the into the flock. But if you don't have that, and most backyard people, I would say all backyard uh, uh, flocks, don't have that personal protective equipment, simple things like uh, 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 gloves or or cover shoes or Make sure you have specific clothes to, um, that you use only when you are servicing your birds. Inanimate objects like equipment, if you're buying, if you're sharing equipment, please make sure you clean, disinfect, and use disposable equipment when, when it's possible. Um, again, that's more of a, a commercial industry setup, animal-proof, bird-proof um, house, but I think also backyards should um, keep that in consideration when they're designing and building their houses. Um, as, as much as you can, keep uh, wild animals, wild birds, rodents, and, and insects out of, your, uh, out of your flock because that's a health risk and that's how um, we prevent that uh, uh, risk from reaching your, uh, your, your birds. Water sanitation, uh, chlorine can be used, iodine can be used, um, but just make sure you're getting water from a clean source and, and um, that is not contaminated by manure or anything like that. And unfortunately with the airborne diseases, um, there's not much we can do. They can, they can fly on feathers, they can fly on, on small particles and reach the flock, but we need to be aware that some of the diseases can, um, can reach the flock through the air. So that's biosecurity in the nutshell. Uh, nutshell. It's understanding that we have some, some diseases that we are fighting against and they take some routes and these routes uh, can be inter, in, uh, prevented through uh, sanitary practices. Now vaccination and treatment, I'm going to mention those with each of the group disease group that we are going to talk about. All right. So now to the, to the main purpose of, of, of this lecture, which is understanding the poultry diseases and poultry disease diagnosis. And hopefully you'll be able to have the frame of mind that you can use to approach any case um, uh, you have. So I used the, the clinical signs, the, the signs that the birds present, to divide the poultry disease into groups by system. 
So we have respiratory diseases, we have digestive diseases, musculoskeletal diseases, and neurological diseases. And there are other diseases, again, um, uh, that we'll discuss, uh, I will discuss separately. Uh, so for each clinical group of these, for each group of diseases, I will discuss general signs of the group, not for each disease, just general signs of the group. I will discuss sample collection if you are trying to uh, uh, confirm your diagnosis. And I will try, um, I will cover general control measures as well for each of the groups. I just want to emphasize that necropsy, which is dissecting the, uh, the birds after they die and looking at the organs and looking at the lesions and trying to identify the uh, problems with these uh, birds is an extremely useful tool for uh, in case of poultry. Uh, we typically use recently dead birds. Um, we, it gives us a clear clinical picture, so it shows us what exactly is going on with, uh, with, the, with the flock. And it gives us a good uh, chance for collecting, sam uh, for collecting good quality samples. The link here below is a video um, um, done by USDA in collaboration with Cornell University, and it's an extremely good uh, video in explaining how can you do a necropsy and what kind of samples do you collect. So I recommend everybody to go, um, go ahead and, and uh, look at that video. It's really useful and, and very educational. And before we dive into each of those groups, that's, that's kind of a, a typical sample that I collect in case I have mortality in my flock. So I collect blood from live birds, and that blood is going to be used for serology, so testing for antibodies in, in the birds. I do swabs to try and isolate the potential bacterial uh, causes. I collect those organs um, and send them for virus isolation and I collect organs for histopathology as well. I was, was want just to say that um, none of the lists in, in this presentation, so I will present you with lists of diseases and lists of lesions, none of the lists in this presentation are comprehensive, so there are more than that. But these are the most common uh, uh, um, diseases and most common lesions. And while they are not comprehensive, it's very good starting point. So um, if you're not very familiar with poultry diseases and you want to start approaching these uh, diseases and trying to diagnose the, the, the problems with your flow, this is a very good one. All right, let's start with the first group of diseases that we are going to discuss. So if you have a flock of birds with increased mortality, um, anorexia, fever, lethargy, so the birds are weak, they are feverish, they are coughing, they are sneezing, they, you have respiratory noises like growls and wheezing. You start seeing discharges coming from the nasal and ocular um, orifices. Um, you see swollen heads, swollen sinuses, so that's a swollen head bird. Um, you can see the infraorbital sinus in this bird is swollen as well. You see a lot of lacrimation in the eye. Um, inflamed eyelids. When you see all of these lesions, all of these clinical signs, I'm sorry, these are clinical presentations. When you see all these uh, clinical signs, that's very suggestive of a respiratory disease. Now you bring mortality, and hopefully you'll all learn about necropsy through that video, and you start looking at the lesions. Um, you start seeing inflammation of the hip tissues. So this is a cross-section across the nostrils, looking into the nasal cavities. When you do that, you'll start seeing turbinate bones, and these turbinate bones should be pink in color, and, they're, um, and there's no exudate. And as you can see here, these turbinate bones are inflamed, they're dark in color, there's a lot of exudate in them. Uh, conjunctivitis, inflammation of the eyelids. Uh, inflammation uh, uh, of the eyes typically comes with a lot of lacrimation and eye, uh, uh, redness of the eye. Tracheitis, which means inflammation of the trachea. So here is a normal trachea, and it's almost translucent. You can see through the tissue of the trachea. 
And if you look at the surface of, uh, of the trachea, it should be smooth, shiny, with not a lot of oxidate on, on, on the surface of the, of the mucosa. But here in the picture below, you can see the trachea is inflamed. And there's a lot of exudate on it, and it's thickened. Um, but also, there's a lot of mucus in the trachea. They, these are all signs of inflamed trachea, which means tracheitis. Pneumonia, or inflammation of the lungs. Um, in this picture, you can see different stages of pneumonia, different stages of, of inflammation. And the one on the far left here is the normal is the normal pink one. And then as the degree of inflammation increases, the darkness and the, and the congestion of the lung increases. Air sacculitis, air sacs are part of the normal anatomy of the respiratory system of the birds. Um, and these are the syntranslucent membranes in the uh, body cavity. And if you, when you open that body cavity, these membranes should be translucent, thin, and transparent, and with no fluids on them. So once you're starting seeing fluids, like what we see in the picture here, uh, there is a lot of fluid, there is a lot of, of bubbles, what we call suds. That's an early sign of inflammation. So these air sacs are inflamed. And then later on, this fluid exudate will become solidified and become looking like a cheesy material or, or pus and this is what we call the polyserositis. It's now not only the air sacs, but also the membrane on the liver, the membrane on the heart. Uh, so we will have air sacculitis, um, uh, pericarditis, perihepatitis, um, and that's what we call polyserositis. And that's a late stage of inflammation. So if you have mortality and you open the birds and you look at this, this is a late respiratory infection. And, 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 and um, and particularly involving the air sacs and the sorrels and membranes in the, in the body cavity. All right, so when you see these lesions, birds coughing, sneezing, when you open the, the mortality and you see these um, tracheitis, air sacculitis, pneumonia, that's a sign of respiratory disease. And the, that's a list of diseases we think about when we have a respiratory disease. So we have viral infection that will cause respiratory disease like Newcastle disease, infectious bronchitis, infectious laryngotracheitis, and avian influenza. We have bacterial infection that will cause respiratory disease. Mycoplasma, there are four pathogenic mycoplasma species in poultry. Coelibacillosis, which is E. coli. Foul cholera, which is Pastrella multocida. Infectious coryza, which is Avibacterium paragolinearum and turkey coryza, which is Bordetella avium. We also have fungal infection, typically in younger birds, um, and aspergillosis, aspergillus flavus, and aspergillus fumigatus is the two main species causing the, that infection. Parasitic infection, some of the parasitic infections will affect the respiratory system, and Cryptosporidae is a protozoan parasite, and gape worm is a round worm. It's called Syngenus trachea, and it exists in the lumen of the trachea. So that's the rollout list that we have for respiratory diseases. Now, how do we differentiate between them? How do we know which one is causing the disease? Um, again, if you're not a veterinarian, um, you don't really um, uh, bother about the name of the disease, but it's important to know that you have a respiratory disease, and if you are going to send samples to the veterinarian or to the diagnostic lab, these are the samples that you need to collect. You collect blood from the live birds, um, and, and as you can see in the picture here, that's the wing vein. That's where we collect blood from birds. Um, and that blood is going to be used to, uh, for serology, detecting antibodies in, in the body of the bird. You collect this set of organs, you collect eyelids, tracheas, lungs, and kidneys, and send them for the histopathology. Um, you collect the same set of organs, eyelids, tracheas, lungs, and kidneys, and send them for virus isolation in case you're suspecting viruses. So basically, you use your uh, 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 morbid birds that you perform necropsy on 
uh, to collect the set of organs and, and send them for histopathology or virus isolation. Um, if you don't have uh, a lot of mortality, if you have only live births that are showing clinical signs, you can use swabs like tracheal swabs, coenal swabs. Coena is a, is a slit, an opening in the roof of the mouth that's connecting the oral cavity to the nasal cavity. It's a very good space to uh, swab for respiratory diseases. It can be used for identifying bacteria, but it can also be used for identifying viruses. Uh, we prefer tissues for virus identification, but tracheal swabs can be used as well, or coenal swabs. Tracheal swabs can be performed on live births um, uh, uh, um, as well. Air sac swabs have to be on, on uh, necropsy sessions. All right, control. So you send your samples to the lab, and the veterinarian or the lab comes back to you and says it's a vaccine, it's a, a viral infection. And in this case, we need to think about vaccination. A lot of viral infections in the poultry diseases have very successful uh, uh, commercial vaccines available for them. And probably it might be too late for this flock, but if you're planning on purchasing new birds or replacing the current flock, um, you need to think about vaccination and vaccination programs. And at the, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to give you a list of all the available, not all the available, the available vaccines uh, for the diseases that we discussed today. So uh, again, that's going to be a good reference for you uh, when you're thinking about vaccination programs. Supportive treatments, so make sure you have enough food, make sure you have clean water, uh, temperature is right. Um, uh, I recommend to increase the temperature of the house if that's possible by a couple of degrees. That's going to help the birds. Um, disinfectants and 